Good morning and uh, welcome. Continuing with the third portion of Beratius, chapter 2, verse 20. So now that Adam named all the animals, and he named them by the name with which they were created, So Adam could see the divine energy within the animals. Now we learn about the separation of Adam and Eve. As we learned earlier that Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, were created as one combined entity. What we would refer to today sort of as Siamese twins. Back to back, facing away from each other. That was the one entity called Adam, and now we learn, verse 20, Vayikra Adam Shemes, that Adam, or the man, gave names, Lechol HaBehema, to every animal, and every fowl in the air, in the heavens, and to every beast of the field, but of all those animals, he didn't find a mate for himself. So, he was still alone. Twenty Ula Adam Le Motza Ezer continued in twenty one by Yapil. Hashem Alakim Tadema Kisha Hevion when he brought the animals heavy and lafan of Kalminumin Zachar Nakeva. He brought them before him, every species, male and female. Omar he said, Lakulam Yesh Benzug. For each one there is a mate, Vili Ain Benzug, and I don't have a mate. Miyad immediately vayapel, God called the anesthesiologist and caused him to fall into a deep sleep. Twenty-one vayapel Hashem Elokim Tardema Ala Odom and God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. Vayishon and he slept. Vayikach and he took. Achas mitzalosov using Rashi's interpretation, one of his sides. Not one of his ribs, but one of his sides. By Yisger, Bosar, Tachtena. He also had the plastic surgeon come in. And they closed the place up with flesh. And he separated the male-female creation into two separate people, a male and a female. Mitzal says Rashi, Mistorov, this means a side. Kamei, like the word tsela is used, in Exodus 26, as a side. O the tzela ha-mishkan, and the side of the mishkan. Zeo sha'amru, this is based upon the teaching which Rashi quoted earlier, and here he gives the chapter and verse, shnei partzufim nivru, that when man was created, God created a man-woman creation with two faces, facing away from each other, joined at the back. Then he separated them into two people, spun them around, introduced them, and said, now, get along. Vayisger mekeim achosach, the place of the cut. Vayishon vayikach, shalayirach tich sabosar v'shebevenu nibris, which is basolov, so that Adam should not see the piece of flesh from which Eve was created, and she be humbled by it, so the process was all done while he was unconscious. 22, Vayiv and Hashem Elokim Esatzelo, and Hashem constructed the side. Asher Lokach, which he took Mino Odom from Adam, Le'isha, he formed and fashioned that side into a woman. Vayiv Yeho El Ha'odam, he now brought the woman to Adam and introduced her. Vayiven Kibinyan, he built woman like a building, Rechava Milmata, wider at the bottom, uktsara milmaila, narrower above. A woman has a narrower waist. Lekabel havlod, Hashem created her in that way so that she could receive and carry a child. Ka'etzer shalchitim, like a storehouse. of wheat, shurach of milmata, which is wider at the bottom, the kotzer milmaila, and that is why Hashem fashioned woman in that style. So that the burden not to be too heavy for the supporting walls. And Hashem miraculously created woman that she can carry a uh, 
full-grown fetus within her and be able to support it. By even as atzei lo isha, is isha to be what is now called isha, woman. As we learned that the word isha comes from the idea of ki ish, lukochazos, because she is taken from ish, that's why she's isha. To be an apod, so this is le'isha. Just very quickly here, a uh, balaturim here. If I can find it. The balaturim says, Vayivieho, he brought her. The word Vayivieho is written in an abridged version. And if you count the numerical value of the letters as it is written, it comes to 24. And this represents the 24 ornaments which the Mishnah talks about with which a bride is brought to her groom. You bring a bride to the chuppah. You know, brides spend a lot of time, months and months before the wedding, they get fitted for a gown and they get fitted for this and for that. And a bride comes to her wedding uh, perfect. So Hashem brought Chavo, Eve, to Adam, to Adam, all adorned in the 24 uh, decorations, so to speak, uh, makeup and jewelry and everything that a woman needs to be beautiful. So that's an interesting Baal Haturim on this verse. So now we read in 23, and the man said, Zos hapam, this time you got it right. All the animals were not fitting mates, but Zos hapam, this time now, etzem me'atzomai, this is a bone of my bones, uvosan mipsori, and flesh of my flesh. So there is what we call compatibility, lezeis yikore isha, to this creation. One can refer to and call her Isha because he named all of the animals. He also named the woman Isha ki ish lukachazos because she is taken from an Ish. That's why she's Isha. Rashi zos hapam melamed sheba adam al kol behem v'chaye v'lein eskara date bohem the Gemara in Yevamas teaches us that Adam tried to have a relationship with the animals, but it didn't work. And he realized that man has to have a relationship only with a woman. One expression derives from the other. Mikan, this is one of the proofs the Medrash brings down. That the world was created in the holy tongue because an example here is that Isha comes from Ish. If the world was created in French, then that wouldn't work. The world was created in Lashon HaKodesh. We're approaching verse 24, which is a very central, very important verse. al Cain, therefore, God instituted within the nature of creation, within the system of the world, that Yaz of Ish, that man should forsake, should leave, as Oviv, his father, as Ima and his mother, Vidovak be Ishtay and cleave unto his wife, Vahoyu Labasar Echar, and they become one flesh. And this is an interesting teaching, first of all, in the most simple sense. Man is raised by his parents, a woman is raised by her parents. It's very normal that people get very attached to their parents. They are the DNA of their parents. Hashem decrees and says that's okay up to a certain point. But then there comes a point where man leaves his father, he leaves his mother, and the same goes for the woman. She leaves her father and leaves her mother. And the husband and wife cleave to each other. Here you have two strangers who become one unit, and this is the miracle called marriage. Now, there's a lot of marital dysfunction 
because that doesn't happen. Because he doesn't leave his parents, and there are books and books written about that, and she doesn't leave her parents, and therefore they have a problem connecting. So the first condition is that man has to leave his parents and woman has to leave her parents, then they can become a unit. Now, it doesn't mean that after people marry, they shouldn't visit their parents. That's not, you know, what would happen to Hallmark if there was no Mother's Day? That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, that there could be separation and people visit their parents. And this separation is a critical component. That's in the simplest sense. In a much deeper sense, this is the verse which explains that only this male-female, man-woman, husband-wife relationship is the appropriate relationship of what we would refer to as a relationship of intimacy. All other forms of intimacy are inappropriate. Which means that only a man and a woman should cleave to each other and they should not be related to each other and all of the laws relating to the idea of Torah relationships. And here Rashi alludes to it a little bit. Verse 24, Rashi, Al Kain Yazav Ish, Ruach Hakadosh Emeres Kain. The Holy Divine Spirit makes this statement: Leser Al Bnei Neach Aroyus. That even the non-Jews, before the Torah was given, and the legal term for that are Noahides, are also forbidden in immoral behavior. They could not just sleep with anybody they wanted to, but there is an appropriate relationship by Torah law. And that is the man-woman relationship who are not related to each other. The big question is, which is posed by the Gemara, the Bible, the Chumash says, the Torah says, they become one flesh. Where do we see that a husband and wife, that a man and woman become one flesh? The fact of the matter is that men and women marry all the time and they're two very separate people. Or as the old joke goes, which you share it, which I've shared at weddings, is that a marriage is where you take two separate people, transform them into one entity, and they spend the rest of their life fighting. She says to him, "You're going to become me," and he says to her, "Heck no, you're going to become me." And they're killing each other until the lawyers win. So the question is, where do they actually become one flesh? They're always two separate entities. Yet if the Torah says they become one, it must mean that they become one. So Rashi gives us the answer. You know when a man and a woman become one? When a baby is born, when a child is born. Because suddenly the child is half his and half hers, and forever and ever and ever the child connects them to each other. Even if they're divorced, they're connected through the child. And that is the miracle of making from two one. That is the idea of the birth of a child, which is the DNA of the father and the mother. And that's what Rashi says. The child is created via both of them. And in the child, their flesh becomes one. And that's a oneness that can never be separated. The child is father and mother. 25, they were both naked. That was before the garment industry. Ha'adam, the man, the Ishtay and his wife, is Beishashu. And there was no embarrassment and no shame. Why is that? Because the whole idea of modesty was a non issue, because modesty is only appropriate when there is a Yetzer Hara, when there is an evil inclination taking the whole idea of intimacy, which is holy, and making it unholy. And that's the battle of the Yetzer Tov and the Yetzer Hara. But before they ate from the tree of knowledge, engaging in intimacy was like putting on film. It was a mitzvah. And there was nothing embarrassing about it. There was nothing immodest about it because there was no desire of the Yetzer Hara. It's only when good was confounded with evil, when again the holiest act 
within life, which is intimacy, becomes an unholy act by the visions of the Yetzirah and an appropriate intimacy and so on, that's when nakedness becomes an issue. 25, they had no idea of the whole school of modesty. To know that there is something called good or something called evil. It's not that he was stupid. He had tremendous intelligence. He was able to name the animals' names. He didn't have an evil inclination. What is an evil inclination? Evil inclination takes good things and makes them evil and then confuses good with evil. And then it's up to man to spend the rest of his life distinguishing between good and evil. Is this good or is it evil? Ad that condition did not come upon them until he ate from the tree. Venichnas Sahara, suddenly he had what we would call today the evil inclination. So suddenly there is all kinds of strange foreign desires, and one has to battle is this good? Or is this not good? And he began to distinguish good and bad. In that case, he says, you know what? When you walk outside, you got to wear clothing. You can't not wear clothing. It's immodest. It's inappropriate. It's just not comfortable. And this is the realization of the tree of good and evil, meaning knowing that there is something called good, something called evil, a gift of free choice, that was a new creation. And now, as we enter into chapter 3, we read the whole story of how that comes about. Because up to that point in time, they were living in the Garden of Eden, and they had no idea of good and evil. Now, we're about to learn in the commentaries that although one might think how long did they live in the Garden of Eden before the story of the serpent and the eating of the tree of, of, of good and, and evil? Well, did they live there for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, for six months, for three weeks, for two days? The answer is for a few hours. All of this happened on the day of creation. Verse 1. Verse 1. And the serpent was, the word orum means subtle, guile, sharp. Mikhail chaya sasode. He was filled with more wisdom or guile or sneakiness than all the other animals of the field. Asher asa Hashem alakim, which God Hashem made. And he said to the woman, Is it true that God said, Do not eat from any tree in the garden? What does this have to do with it? He should have simply said that God made for Adam and Eve garments of skin, and he clothed them, and have a good day. They were naked, and now they're wearing clothes. El Alimed, the Torah teaches, you me eza eitze, kavatz anachash aleim. What was the story? Why did the serpent give them a hard time? Why is the serpent involving himself in their business? You can't eat, you can't eat. If the serpent wants to eat, he can eat. The answer is, it's all about intimacy. Ro esamarumim, the serpent saw them naked. And he saw them engaging in intimacy. Publicly because there was no shame. So the serpent said, hey, this is good. Let me be the one to engage in intimacy with Chava. I just got to get rid of him. So he developed a plan to get rid of him. And this was the plan. That she gets him to eat and God kills him. And... Uh, he gets the princess, and they live happily ever after. Orum Mikhail, the fi armose ugdolose, being that he was so sharp and he was so great, haisamapalose, that's how hard he fell. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Orum Mikhail, he was more subtle and 
more sharp than any other animals, or Mikael, at the end it says that he becomes cursed more than any of God's creation. The serpent began and said, Is it true that God said you can't eat of any of the garden? Even though he saw them eating other fruits, this was just to enter into a general conversation with her, in order that she should answer him, and he could come to speak about that particular tree. So he was entering into conversation. Very often when there are predators who are after something, they enter into an innocent-sounding conversation with their victim just to get into the door. So you got to be careful of predators, no matter what they say. I recently heard a nice uh, saying, I, I, am, I am so paranoid, I have a rear view mirror on my stationary bike. Verse 2, So the woman said to the serpent, No, God didn't tell us we can't eat of any of the fruits of the tree. Silly serpent. We may eat of all the fruits of the, all the trees. That's not a problem. But of the fruit of the tree, that's in the midst of the garden. God said, don't eat of it. Furthermore, and here she created a problem because she added her own. He also said, don't touch it. God never said don't touch it. He just said don't eat it. But you know how it is people like to add stuff. Pen to musun, lest you die. So here she exaggerated. She amplified. And she got into trouble because he pushed her against it. And he said, you see, nothing happened. She added to the commandment of God. Therefore, in the end, she ended up reducing it. King Solomon and his wisdom. In Proverbs says, I'll tell you about the word of don't add to God's words, because when you add to God's words, you'll end up diminishing. I remember as a kid hearing uh, this from my father, blessed memory, that uh, a kid comes to school. And he says to his Rebbe, to his teacher, do you know what I saw? I saw a squirrel, and the tail was a mile long. And the teacher says, are you kidding? Do me a favor. A squirrel is like this. You know what a mile is? Come on. I told you not to exaggerate. He says, you're right. The tail was a half a mile long. He says, what are you talking about? Do you know what a half a mile is? Don't exaggerate. He says, you're right. It was a quarter of a mile. He says, come on. He says, OK. It was 100 feet. He says, come on, what are you, how can a Chinook for 100 feet? He says, you're right. You're right, I was exaggerating. It was six feet long. He says, come on, the squirrel was like this. Tail is six feet long. He says, all right, you're right. It was two feet long. He says, come on, squirrel's like this, two feet long. He says, pretty soon that squirrel's going to have no tail at all. You know, you can't just destroy the tail. That's a childhood story that my dad used to tell. That, you know, people have a need to exaggerate, but then they get into trouble, and then the whole tail gets lost. Now, imagine a squirrel without a tail. I mean, that's pathetic, and that comes from exaggeration. So let the squirrel have its tail. If you missed the point, you can talk to me after class. Okay. If you got lost in the translation, because he told it to me in Yiddish. Verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, the serpent says, what are you, Hakana Chinik? You're not going to die. Do me a favor. Why is God telling you this? Because God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes are going to be opened. It's smart food. You're going to be like God. Knowing good and evil, whatever that means. And God doesn't want you to become too smart. So that's why God told you not to eat from the fruit of that tree. So listen to me, said the serpent. Eat from the fruit, and it's all going to be good. Zog okay. 
that gets lost in the translation for sure. Verse 4, I don't know if we did 4 in Rashi. He pushed her until she touched it. Oh, my law, said a serpent, said to her, just as there's no, no death in touching the tree, so also there's no death in eating of the fruit. Now, I want to just pause for a moment and say that there are various interpretations in this story. What does the serpent represent? Obviously, the serpent represents the evil in there's a little serpent within each and every one of us, that little voice inside of us who is always on the edge, always trying to get us to sin, always pushing us to the precipice of the abyss and then pushing us in and saying, nah, 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 gotcha. So in that case, is that what the serpent was or was there a real serpent? And if there was a real serpent, is the serpent symbolic of something else? In the traditional Jewish mode of learning and studying Chumash, they're both true. There was a real serpent, and the serpent represented what we call the evil inclination. They're both true. And obviously in our lives, the serpent represents the serpent within us. Verse 5, Rashi, Ki Deya, God wants to cut out the competition. If you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will be godlike. God does not want you to be godlike. Ki Deya says, Rashi, Kol Umen Seines Benim Every craftsman dislikes his fellow craftsman because nobody likes competition. Good morning. So therefore, God dislikes his fellow gods. The plumber dislikes his fellow plumbers. And uh, the orchestra, the, 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 the guy who plays the trumpet dislikes the guys who play the trumpet. So it's just that God doesn't want you to become godlike. Do you know how God became a god? Says the serpent, I'll tell you, I know. Min ha'etz ochal, God ate of the tree, who bought us and then he created the world. He doesn't want you to become a creator. Ve'isem kelakim yetzre you'll become creators of worlds. So she said, really? That's great. Verse 6, and the woman saw that the tree looks good enough to eat. And that it was delightful to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make someone wise. So she took of its fruit and she ate it. And she ate it. Once she ate it, she says, hey, if I'm going to die, he's going to die too. <laughs> Forget it. So she gave her husband as well, and she says, you better eat this or I'll kill you. And he ate it as well. Verse 6, So she saw the word of Shalnachash, the words of the serpent, and they were pleasant, pleasing to her, and she trusted the serpent. The serpent turned to her and said, Look at me, would I lie to you? That the tree is good to make you godlike. Your eyes will be open wide. He told her, Recognizing good and evil. She also gave her husband, he, that she should not die, and he should live. What's going to happen? Because he'll marry another woman. And that would be bad. Where's he going to get another woman from? Another surgery. To add to the animals. So she gave the animals as well. She wanted to corrupt the whole society. From here we learn that the eyes are very important. It's like when you go to a restaurant and the table is set beautifully and there's china and a tablecloth and flowers. You take that same food, you put it into a doggy bag, put it in your fridge overnight, and then you got to eat leftovers. It's not so appetizing. So it's all in the presentation. That's why it says in the third portion of the Shema, 
Velo sosuru achre levabchem vi achre enechem. Don't follow your heart and your eyes. Say our sages, ha'ayin roe ve halev chomer. The eye sees and the heart desires, so that it's all about visualization. She saw that the tree was tempting. Got to be careful what you see. Seven vatipakachno and both their eyes were open wide by Yedu, and they realized that they were naked. First time, by Yispru Ale Seino, so they took some fig leaves by Yasulham Chagedas, and they made body coverings out of the fig leaves. Seven Vatipakachno Linyan Achachma Dibrakosov. The Torah speaks about opening the eyes in wisdom. They became wise to matters of good and evil. Not that they were able to see. They were able to see earlier. Even a blind person knows he's naked. They had only one commandment at this time because God only gave them one commandment. And they were stripped of this one commandment, so now they were naked of mitzvahs. There are various interpretations as to what was this tree. Rashi brings down the interpretation from the Gemara that it was a fig tree, and that they ate a fig, and therefore they dressed themselves in fig leaf garments. It's uh, very hot this year in Nordstrom, fig leaf garments. Badovar shiniskalkalu bay niskinu. By the very thing by which they sinned, they used that to correct the sin. But the other trees prevented them from taking their leaves. So as they went from tree to tree, the trees refused to give them leaves. Why then doesn't it say specifically in the Bible that this was a tree of figs? In fact, there are many interpretations. Some people say it was a vine and it was a grape that they ate. There's the famous apple. There are the, some say it was grain. There are various opinions. Why doesn't the Torah just come and say what it was? Because if the Torah would specifically, if the Bible would spec out that it was a fig tree, then every time you pass the fig tree, you'd say, oh! This is the fig tree. <laughs> so Hashem doesn't want to embarrass the fig tree, and we should learn from him. This is a medrash in Medrash Tanchuma. Okay, verse 8. By Yishmu, and they heard, as Kil Hashem Elokim, the voice of Hashem their God, Mishalech Bagon, allegorically speaking, walking in the garden, Leruach Hayom, Hayom, to the breeze of the day. So they heard the rustling of Hashem, and the man and his wife hid because of Hashem, God, amongst the trees of the garden. So they hid. There are many midrashim on this verse. Says Rashi, if you want to know some or all of these medrashim, look in medrash Rabbah, look in the other medrashim, but I'm not the guy who's a medrash guy. And here is where Rashi sets forth his raison d'etre, his agenda. My primary function, says Rashi, is to give the simple interpretation. Now, when Rashi brings down the Medrash, there is no other simple interpretation. When Rashi brings down two or three interpretations, they're all necessary for the simple interpretation because one isolated interpretation has too many questions. I only bring down such agoda that help us understand the simple words. Dovor, dovor al ofnov, one thing at a time, and that's my function. But let me just push the pause button here. In the discourse which was published for the weekend which the previous Rebbe passed away, the Bossi Lagani, which the Rebbe went 
and recited a discourse each year on his yard site. And there are 20 different discourses over 20 years, and then he repeated them again because this discourse had 20 paragraphs. This discourse began by quoting a medrash on this verse because the theme of the discourse is that God comes back to his favorite dwelling place, and that is the world, that this world is God's favorite dwelling place. Well, if it's God's favorite dwelling place, then why does it look like it does? The answer is because every time man sinned, God's shechina, the revelation of God's energy, was removed a notch higher. So when the first sin, and this is the first sin, of Adam and Eve came about, then the godly energy went from earth to heaven the second generation sin, it went from heaven one to heaven two, up to heaven seven by the seventh sin. Then came seven great fundamental central holy people, seven tzaddikim, and they are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Levi, Kehos, Amram, and Moshe, and each respectively brought the Shekhinah back from heaven seven to six to five to four, to three, to two, and Moshe came down the mountain and brought godliness down to earth. And therefore, at Mount Sinai, God's manifestation of his divine presence was restored to its original splendor. So in that discourse, he brings down this verse. And he brings down the word, Mishalech, the Medrash says. Mishalech is a strange word. It should have said mehalech. What is mithalech? So the Medrash says, kafitz ve'ozel. It was jumping and skipping. That because of this sin, the divine presence jumped away and ascended up an entire floor, so to speak. So that sin causes God's divine presence to ascend high on high. That's just a little taste of this famous series of discourses. Vayishmu, ma shomu, what did they hear? Shomu eskel HaKadosh Baruch they heard the sound of Hashem, shayim eshalich, bagon, who was walking in the garden. The ruach hayim, leis to ruach shashem eshbalosh, from the direction of wind, to which the sun comes, vizui marobis, that's the west, shalaf neis erev chama b'mayr, because in the evening the sun is in the west. Vahim, and this sin took place, sorchu ba'asiris, in the tenth hour of the day, as the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, that, the whole thing was just a matter of a few hours. They were created on Friday. In fact, they were told if they want to eat the fig, they could have it Friday night after Kiddush. They could have it for dessert. But they couldn't wait, and they couldn't contain themselves in the 10th hour. There are 12 hours in a day. You figure 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So the 10th hour is 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, they sinned. So they took garments, and so now it's 5.30 and the sun is setting. Verse 9, famous verse, Vayikra Hashem Elohim Elodim, God called out to man, Vayim Elohim and said to him, Ayeka, where are you? Now the question is, if God is the creator, he knows everything, why is he saying, where are you? Ayeka, Yedeya, Hu, Hechon, Hu. God knew where he was. El Lekonesim, Ibad Dvorim, Shelo Yehei, Nivelo Hashiv, Im Yamin Yishei, Opisa. To enter into conversation, he shouldn't be shocked or afraid to answer if he's going to the word Yanni Sheo, who means here, punish him. The commentaries on Rashi say that this is probably a mistake. If he enters into him, there's another word that replaces Yanni Sheo, Yachni Sheo, whatever, that he enters into conversation. God said, Where is Hevel, your brother? That God always chooses to enter into conversation. Just very, very quickly, there is the famous story when the Alter Rebbe was in prison, Rabbi Shneir Zalman. And one of the senior ministers came to visit him. And this senior minister, although he was a Gentile, was a great Bible scholar and Torah scholar. And he posed many questions to the Alter Rebbe. One of the questions he posed to them to the Alter Rebbe, to him, is why 
God would ask Adam where he is. Why God would say Ayeka. So the Alter Rebbe says, uh, Rashi comments. So the minister says, what Rashi says, I know without you. I'm asking you what you say. So the Alter Rebbe says to the minister, do you believe in the eternity of Torah? Do you subscribe to the eternity of Torah? That the Torah is eternal? He says, yes, I do. He says, in that case, Vayomer, Hashem Elohim, verse 9, El Ha'odam, God says to every single man, Vayomer lo ayeka, where are you? And the Alter Rebbe went on to say, you're 55 years old, guessing the exact age of the minister. What have you accomplished in your life? Have you accomplished that which you need to accomplish? Are you on track? Do you know where you're going? <clears throat> the minister was very taken with the fact that this verse is God asking every single one of us, so where are you? How you doing? Verse 10, Ayemer, and he said, Adam said to God, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I'm naked, and it felt wrong. So I hid myself. So God says, you're naked, huh? Last time we talked to you were naked, it didn't bother you. By Yehmer, he said, Who told you you're naked? Is it possible that you ate from the tree, which I commanded you not to eat from, and that's why you know you're naked? Where do you know from that there's a problem with naked? Is it possible from the tree? Maybe you ate from the tree that you shouldn't have. Again, I know that's a big portion and we got a lot to learn, but very quickly, I want to share an important teaching. There's a famous teaching in the Gemara, in the Talmud talks about Purim. And the Talmud's premise is that everything that's ever to happen in life is already alluded to in the Torah. So, for example, it says, Esther min Torah minayin. Where does the Torah allude to Esther? It talks about, Va'anochi hastir astir asponai, God concealing his countenance at the end of days in the exile. Then he says, Hamon min Torah minayin. Where does the Torah allude to a creature called Haman? What does Haman have to do with the Torah? Haman was much later. Because everything has to be in the Torah. So the Gemara says, Hamin, the word Hamin has the word Homa, has the letters of Haman. Hamin ha'eitz asher tzivisicha levilti achol mimenu achoto. When God says to Adam, did you eat of the tree? Which tree? The tree I told you not to eat from. Is Did you eat from that tree? That's where Haman, Hamin, Hamin is Haman. So the obvious question is, come on, well, because it has the same letters? The answer is no. Do you know why the Purim story happened? Because the Jews ate of the meal that Achashverosh served. That was a meal to celebrate the demise of the Beis Amigdash, the end of Jerusalem, the end of Israel. It was Ashanda. Hamin ho ate. Did you, the Jewish people, go eat? from that which you shouldn't have eaten, that's where Haman comes from. That's the Haman story. A very beautiful teaching. Verse 12, so immediately when man is challenged, what do you do? What does any man do when he's challenged? He blames it on his wife. So the man said, it's not me. I'm a good guy. This woman that you placed with me, he she's the one that gave me from the tree. The Gemara says that here, Adam displayed lack of appreciation. He should have thanked Hashem for the woman. Instead, he blamed everything negative in his life upon her. So the God says to the woman, is that true? What did you do? And the woman said, it wasn't me. It wasn't me that started that old crazy Asian war. The serpent, he talked me into it. And that's human nature. Man blames his wife, his wife blames her evil inclination, and uh, have a good day.
Wife blames the mother-in-law. Hishiani, hitani, led me astray. So God says, in that case, I have to punish everybody. I need to punish the snake, the serpent. I need to punish the woman. I need to punish the man. So God curses the serpent to be cursed, losing its legs, because up to that point in time, the serpent had legs, like every other animal, and you'll have to slither on your belly, and you'll hate man, and man will hate you, and there'll be an eternal battle between snakes and people, unless you're a snake charmer. So God curses the serpent, that it eats dirt and has a miserable life. God curses the woman, because we're about to learn of the birth of Cain and Abel and their twin sisters. They were born without any difficulty. Chick chock, they were born instantly, no labor pains, and, and so on. God curses the woman that child bearing and child rearing come with great difficulty. And God curses man that bringing food out of the ground come with great difficulty. And from that time on, the serpent is miserable and is in therapy and hates man and man hates the serpent. From that time on, woman is challenged with raising her family, having children, bearing children, and raising them. And man is challenged trying to make a living and make sure that his money doesn't disappear. So that's the story which we're about to learn now. So God says to the serpent, because you did this, you're now going to be cursed of all animals. You're going to walk on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. From here we learn that when somebody tries to convince someone to worship idols, you don't try and defend them. Because had God asked the serpent, why you did this? Because he would have been able to answer the words of the teacher and the words of the pupil, who do you listen to? She shouldn't have listened to me. But the serpent was a mesis, like someone tries to convince someone to worship idols. If he was cursed of all animals, certainly the wild animals. That the gestation time, the pregnancy time of a serpent is seven years longer than any animal. Imagine what that would do to the healthcare system. It had legs, it had feet, and they were cut off. The Eva Oshis 15, and an enmity, a hatred I will place between you and the woman, or between your seed and her seed. Who you shall she shall bruise your head. And you will bruise its heel, and forever and ever men and snakes will be killing each other. The Eva Oshis you didn't intend anything. You wanted him to die so you could marry her. You approached woman instead of man because you figured she was a better target. To be convinced. Then you knew for sure that if he tried to convince her, there wouldn't be a chance. But she could convince him to do anything because that's the nature. Therefore, I will put this hatred in. I will implant this enmity. You will not have any height, and therefore you will bite him in the heel. But even there, from there to Miseno, he will kill you. You will kill him. Because a serpent, God forbid, bites someone in their heel that can ruin their whole day. When the serpent goes to bite, it hisses. I guess it rattles. <laughs> so it uses the word, the, the sound of hissing. I usually like to share at this point in time an interesting teaching. There was a very fine man, a chassid of the Rebbe, in the early days of the leadership of the Rebbe. And he made a living doing whatever it is he did, but he struggled. 
And uh, he was worried. He was always uh, miserable, frustrated. What if he doesn't have enough money? What if there's no business tomorrow? And so on. So one day the Rebbe said to him, let me ask you a question. Do you know which animal is the most miserable animal of all the animals? The serpent. The serpent is very unhappy. Do you know what the serpent eats? The serpent eats, says the Bible, the offer tochal, in verse 14. You shall eat dirt. The serpent eats dirt. So let me ask you a question. If the serpent eats dirt, it should be the happiest person or the happiest creature in the world. There's enough dirt. What's there to be miserable about? Imagine if you had all the money you need. I think there's a great Jackie Mason line. You know that I have all the money I need for the rest of my life if I should die tomorrow morning. But the serpent could live for seven million years and never consume the earth. So why, said the Rebbe to this man, is the serpent always miserable? The answer is because the serpent says, sure, there's enough dirt today, but what's going to happen when I finish all the dirt upon the face of the earth? What am I going to eat then? That's why the serpent is miserable. So the Rebbe has told this very fine chassid, stop being so miserable. There's enough dirt out there. <laughs> You'll make your living. Smile. Be joyous. It's okay. It's a very important lesson in life. We're walking around miserable. I mean, how long does a person live already? 70, 80, 90, 120 years. You're walking around miserable because what's going to happen when I eat up all the dirt? What am I going to eat then? And meanwhile, you're living a life of misery today? Not a good idea. Okay. Baruch HaToh Adonai Eloheinu Melech Eilam Shachal Nibbivari. L'chaim. So that's the curse of the serpent. 16, Elo Isha Omar, to the woman, he said, Harbo Arba Etzveinech Vaheireinech, I will greatly multiply your pain and your grief. Be'etzev tel dibonim. With pain will you beget children. Having children is not going to be easy. Only a root canal is worse. V'yal isheich chukoseich. And your desire will always be toward your husband, but he will have the power over you, whether he's going to fulfill your desire or not. It's That refers not only to bearing children, but it refers to rearing children as well. The trouble of pregnancy. The birth. So every process is covered here. For intimacy. It's immodest for her to verbally demand it. He will initiate. Your desire. There's a lot to be said on verse 16, but we're going to keep moving. Verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because you hearkened to the voice of your wife, and you ate of the tree regarding which I told you, don't eat from it. Let the ground, the earth, be cursed because of you. With toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You're going to plant various seeds, you're going to expect things to grow. It's going to bring up cursed things. You're going to swoop him like flies, parushim and avonim, fleas and ants. Insects will attack weeds. It's like somebody goes off to an evil path and the people curse the breast from which he suckled. So the ground will produce strange things. So the ground is cursed because of what it produces. The troubles of making a living. The Kates Vidardar Tatsmiach Loch, he spells it out here that thorns and thistles will bring forth as you eat of the herb of the field. The Kates Vidardar Tatsmiach Loch, or it's the ground. When you plant seeds, Tatsmiach Kates Vidardar, it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. Kundus Vakovius, artichokes and thistle like plants, which have to be cooked and prepared. 
Life is not going to be easy. You can't just pluck from the ground and eat. In the blessing, he said the same thing. The earth is cursed because of you. In toil, you shall eat it. And then it's going to give forth thorns and thistles. When you're going to plant a vegetable garden, it's going to bring forth for you thorns and thistles and other weeds, and you're going to have no choice, but you may have to eat them because you have no other foods. 19 famous verse, with the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread, so that all your life you're going to be busy making a buck. Until you return to the earth. Because from there you were taken. Very famous. Because dust Thou art, we'll offer toshuv, and dust to dust you shall return. And this is dust to dust, that a person is created from the earth and returns to the earth and spends the middle 70, 80, 120 years worrying about how to put food on the table. Other than that, life is great. 19, after you will exhaust yourself very much, you'll be able to put some food on the table. Even after a person makes money, he has to worry that he shouldn't lose the money, shouldn't make a bad investment. So this is the condition of serpent, woman, and man to this day. What is our challenge, by the way, or our opportunity, is to have enough trust and faith in God to have a quality life, nevertheless. And that is done through kindness and goodness and prayer and Torah study and tzedakah and all the good things that the Torah tells us. 20, and the man named his wife Chava, because she was the mother of all living beings. The Torah goes back to the first subject. He was giving names. And then he pauses and he tells you the story of Chava. That's why that's why God put him to sleep. And then it says that they were naked. It was all about nakedness and the serpent wanting to have an intimate relationship with Chava. There came that guile and that plan. It's like Chaya. She gives life to her children. Closing verse of today's portion. So instead of walking around with fig leaves, God made for Adam and his wife kosnes air, garments of skin, a mink coat. And he clothed them. 21 kosnes air. What's garments of skin? What skin? What are we talking about? There is a medrash that says that God caused them to develop a garment-like shell, which was smooth like a fingernail. And attached to their skin. Others say no. We're talking about normal, natural clothing. Stuff that comes from skin. Like the wool of rabbits, which is soft and warm. And he made it for them. Garments. So they were wearing... Uh, Rabbit skin coats. But in any event, God created garments from them so they shouldn't have to walk around simply with a fig, with fig leaf. Just to end on a lighter note, there's a story told that uh, this woman comes in and she's modeling this beautiful mink coat. And her daughter just came back from Berkeley, California. And she joined a group of environmentalists that were anti-mink. And uh, the, the daughter starts screaming at her mother abusively, and she says, how can you wear that? How dare you? Do you know what the animal had to go through just so you can wear that mink? And the mother slaps her across the face, and she says, don't you ever talk about daddy like that. End of portion.